Well, let's put those hands together and add our voice to it right now. Come on, let the redeemed of the Lord say so on Friday night. Make a joyful noise to the Lord right now. I am so thankful to be in church tonight, and I want you to know I have immensely enjoyed my time at the Power Conference, and I'm just thrilled. Thank you, Bishop Hodum. Thank you, Pastor Hodum. Thank you, all these sponsors, all the preachers. It has been such a privilege to be here, and I'm glad that I made the drive east to Mississippi. How many of you are from Mississippi? Would you wave at me if you're from Mississippi? Now, how many of you are glad you're from Mississippi? Would you wave at me? Amen. I was in Mississippi last week. I'm in Mississippi this week. I'll be in Mississippi, Lord willing, next week. I may need to just change my citizenship to Mississippi. I am so grateful to be here, and uh, I hail from Cabot, Arkansas. How many of you have ever spent some time in Arkansas? Would you raise your hand? These are the blessed and the anointed ones among us right now. Cabot is about an hour and a half from the town of 56, Arkansas. And yes, you heard me right, 56, Arkansas. It's not the number five and the number six. It's completely spelled out. 56 is a suburb of Y, Arkansas. Not W-H-Y, just Y. And then Cabot is about 45 minutes east of Pickles Gap, Arkansas. And Pickles Gap is just next door to my favorite town in our state, Toad Suck, Arkansas. Now, how many of you are glad you're in Corinth tonight? (laughs) Amen. What a privilege to be among God's people, and I understand my place tonight. I want to just set the table for everything the Lord will speak through Brother Huntley, and it has been a high honor to be with Brother Wayne Huntley this week. This has been such a treat. Aren't you thankful for his dynamic, powerful ministry? I appreciate you, Brother Huntley. I will direct your attention to the book of Acts, chapter number one. I have several friends here. Brother Britt, brothers Carney, sister Britt, I believe, is here. And then, of course, several others that I know, and I am just appreciative to see all of you. And I'm excited about what God is doing in this part of the country. I'm grateful for that. And I believe that the Lord still has something for us tonight before we leave this this conference. Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120 men and brethren. This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost spoke by the mouth of David concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Verse 21, wherefore, of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed to Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Verse 26, And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven 
as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to direct your attention to one single word in the second verse of Acts chapter number 2, and it is where I will lift my title for this message tonight. It is simply the word, suddenly. Would you say that word with me, suddenly? I want you to turn to someone near you right now and say to them, God has a word for you tonight. Amen. My wife has been in prayer for this meeting all while this conference has been going on. I know you've been praying, and I wish one more time we would set our Bibles down and lift up our voices and holy hands in His presence and invoke His glory on this arena right now. Would you pray that the gift of faith will operate this evening in the name of Jesus? Lord, it is by Your authority that we come to this sacred time. And I pray, Lord, that You will set the table for every miraculous demonstration that you will bring about on this Friday night. Let there be no hindrances, let there be no distractions, Lord, but give us a clear word and clear direction as we leave this power conference this weekend. We thank you, we give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the preeminence, Lord. It belongs to you and you alone. We praise you. And we pray to you in your matchless name, the name of Jesus. And everybody, would you say amen? Amen. One more time, would you say suddenly? God bless you. You may be seated. It was a statement made to me recently by an elder minister that I took note of. When he simply said, Brother Gaddy, the older that I get the more I realize that I don't have nearly everything figured out. That is a thought-provoking statement. It is not an excuse to not be convinced of the truth, but it is simply the fact that God is God and I am not. God is God. And we have to let him be God. We have to trust him as the one who knows all things. One of the things that I am realizing more and more is that one of the most pointed attacks that the devil will ever make on people that are seeking God will be targeted at the point of their faithfulness. God loves faithfulness. Churches are built on faithful people. That's why Paul declared it to the Corinthians in the fourth chapter, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. The wise proverb writer penned profound words when he said, a faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Let me preach it clearly and directly to some people in this arena tonight every single day that we draw a line in the sand and square our shoulders and lift our voice and declare our faithfulness to God, I will tell you tonight, you and I are blessed when we assume that posture. There is a great anointing upon faithful people. There is a stability that comes in the kingdom of God because of faithful people. That's why Jesus was speaking and he 
made it clear, his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. When we stand before God, he's not going to say, Well done, good and talented servant. He's not going to say, Well done, good and charismatic servant. He's going to say, How faithful were you? And if you were faithful, that's well done. And so God loves faithfulness. But hear me tonight. The devil hates faithfulness. He hates anything associated with faithfulness to God. It's why he will fight us. At the point of faithfulness, it's why he spoke to Adam and Eve and questioned, has God really said that you'll die if you'll eat that forbidden fruit? It was a plot to discredit God's command to be faithful to his word. The reason why the enemy will fight so hard against you and against me being faithful is because when you and I are faithful, it makes us like our Lord. Paul said to the Corinthians, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our Lord. He told the Thessalonian church, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. If the devil hates faithfulness, I want to be faithful to God. If God loves faithfulness, I've decided I'm going to rise up every single morning and say, I will walk with God. Come on, I've come to preach to a preacher right now. When you have church and it doesn't turn out too well, step back in that pulpit, preach that word from God, declare the whole counsel of God, stay faithful. The devil hates faithfulness. I was preaching many years ago in southern Illinois. It was in the sleepy town of Glendale, Illinois. I know you may have never heard of Glendale. It's not the suburb of anything. I called the pastor. I said, Pastor, can you give me directions to get to your church and just give them to me from when I hit the city limits? That'll be fine. And he just laughed at me. He said, son, we don't have city limits. We gauge everything by trees and fence posts. That's when I knew I was in the sticks. We started a revival on Sunday morning. I hadn't been preaching all that long. And he said, we're going to go Sunday morning, Sunday night. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're going to give you Saturday off and then finish Sunday morning and Sunday night. I thought to myself when I got this invitation, Lord, that's many services. I don't have that many sermons. I've only got about six of them. So I guess what I'll do is I'll preach all six of those. And then I'll massage them a little bit. I'll change the title a little bit. And maybe make it through the rest of the revival. We started on that Sunday morning and it was a small congregation. But oh, they loved to worship God. And it was the kind of church where we had testimony service. How many of you remember those days? And there was only one prerequisite for testimony service. You had to be breathing. And if you were breathing, not only should you testify, you were expected to testify. And I watched a sweet white-haired lady at the back of the church. And ever so often someone would pop up and give a testimony and she'd be ready to jump up and be a little bit late and they'd sit down and she'd start to get up out of the pew and someone else would beat her up. And so she probably was the last one every single Every single service to testify. I always also notice that during the worship service while we were all singing, you know, I have great admiration for people that clap on the two and the four. Those of you that are music people, you know how valuable that is. Because there's other people, they're consistently clapping on the one and the three. Let me just show you what I'm talking about. 
Can you give me the key of G for Jesus, brother? Oh, I'll fly away, oh, glory, I'll fly away. Now, most of you right now are clapping on the two and the four. You are musically advanced. Let's sing it again, and let's clap on the one and the three. You ready? Oh, I'll fly away, oh, glory, I'll fly away. Good, 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 that's good. This sweet lady in the back of the Glendale church, she didn't clap on the two and the four or the one and the three. She clapped on the one quarter and the three and an eighth. She was always several beats off. It was the most awkward looking clap that I've ever seen in my life. And yet she was there every single service. We got ready to close out that revival on that Sunday night. My voice was hoarse. I'd preached everything I knew and a few things I didn't know. We got done with service and I walked toward the back to leave the sanctuary. And sweet sister Davis, the white-haired elderly lady, was sitting in the back and she intercepted me in the middle aisle. She stepped right out in the aisle and blocked the way. And have you ever met anybody that doesn't understand personal space? You ever, under, you ever met anybody that instead of talking to you from a very nice distance, say, I'm not going, don't worry, Bishop, I'm not going to get up in your face. They get right up in your business. Sister Davis was one of those gals. She'd live long enough, it really didn't matter anymore. She got right up in my face and she said, that was good preaching, son. Just yelling at me. I said, thank you, sister, I appreciate that. And she started in on an explanation that I did not ask for. She said, son, let me tell you something. This has been a good revival, and every single day about 4 o'clock, I lay down for my nap. She said, I'm 89 years old, and I usually nap for at least two hours every single day. And every day at 6 o'clock when I wake up, she said, I have a decision to make. One voice jumps up on my shoulder and says, Sister Davis, just stay in tonight. Everybody knows you're an elderly lady. Just lay up tonight. Rest up for tomorrow night. Nobody's going to feel bad at you. Pastor's not going to feel bad at you. The evangelist won't feel bad at you. Just stay in. And she said, but just as sure as that voice speaks, another voice gets in the other ear and says, come on, Sister Davis. Get up, it's time for church. Come on, Sister Davis. Get your clothes ready. Fix your hair. It's time for revival. It's revival time at the church. She said, sir, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been here every single night of this revival. She said, I have 10% hearing in this ear. I have no hearing in this ear. She said, I have heard about every tenth word that you preached. She said, but oh, it's been good. And then without asking my permission, this sweet 89-year-old lady lifted up her voice and she said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise God for saving me. Now, you're going to have to pardon me on a Friday night, but I've got good hearing. I've got good feet. I've got a healthy body. I will be faithful to God. Come on, are there any apostolics in the house that would say, as for me in my house, we'll be faithful in worship. We'll be faithful in the house of God. We'll be faithful to the kingdom. Woo! 
Oh, I got a challenge for somebody. When you have a good day, stay faithful. When you have a bad day, stay faithful. When you feel like a million bucks, stay faithful. When you don't have a dollar in the bank, stay faithful. I will bless the Lord at all times. When you've had a setback, and it seems prayers are going unanswered. When you have failed yourself and failed God, get back in the battle. When you fall down, dust yourself off, repent of your sins, and become faithful. When you have a victory, stay faithful. When you feel all right, stay faithful. Stay faithful to God. Come on, somebody clap your hands with me right now. Woo! <laughs> the year was 2000. My wife and I had planted our church about six months prior to that. And it was coming up on the springtime of the year, and it was time for Pentecost Sunday, year 2000. We would all survive Y2K, and now we were at Pentecost Sunday. I think it's interesting that this is Pentecost Sunday weekend. And as a very young church of just a few months, we had determined we were going to have a blowout Pentecost Sunday. We had about 15 people come into our church at the time. And I remember paying for slick ads and door hangers and advertising. We canvassed entire areas of our city. We prayed over doors and prayed and fasted in, in chains of people. It was a rather small chain, but it was a chain nonetheless. We prepared. We got everything ready. Brother Huntley, I had a good sermon to preach on Pentecost Sunday. Our music team, which consisted of two people, had a pretty good song to sing on Pentecost Sunday. I was primed. I, I, I was believing that the doors were going to open on Sunday and dozens of people were going to flood through and we have a massive outpouring of the Holy Ghost. At that time, we were having afternoon church on Sunday afternoons because we were renting another church's facility it got about 1.45 and I was pacing back and forth in the Sunday school room in the back of the building and I was so excited about what God was going to do. I walked out about a, two minutes or so before church was to start in order to start the service off and I looked with anticipation through the back doors of the sanctuary to find that there were not many people there. And I'm here to testify to you that on Pentecost Sunday 2000, we had seven people. Now some of you are waiting for the rest of that sentence. Some of you are expecting Brother Gaddy to say we had seven people receive the Holy Ghost. We had seven people water baptized. No, no. That was it. The period should have been right there. On Pentecost Sunday, 2000, we had seven people. I didn't feel like God's man of power for the hour. I stood up and led worship that day, and the worship was pitiful. The preaching was very pitiful. The reason why I can say that is because I was the preacher. I think out of pity, the six other people, when I gave the altar call, came forward just to make me feel a little bit better about being in the ministry. We had a mediocre season of prayer. So much planning had gone into this. So much preparation had gone into this. We'd spent money we didn't have for this. I get done with the service and I put on the pastor smile. I had a lady meet me at the back door. She was also a lady that didn't understand personal space. 
She looked at me and God love her. She said, Pastor, I'm disappointed. And normally, normally I have a pretty good filter. But I didn't have a filter that day. I looked at her and I said, I am too. Truth be told, I was shattered. We'd spent all this money, all this time. I'd gone without meals for this. So I got in the car. I had to head down to a youth camp. I was on youth leadership team at the time in our district. And I called my pastor. I said, Pastor, are you in your office? He pastors in Little Rock. Brother Lumpkin said, yes, sir, I am. I'm getting ready for church tonight. I said, can I have five minutes of your time? He said, sure, come on by. I walked into my pastor's office. I'm on my way to the campground to lead a youth camp. I walk into my pastor's office. I sit down in the chair, and I start crying like a baby. I'm just sobbing in front of my pastor. Pastor, we planned all this. We passed out tracks. We knocked doors. We prayed. We fasted. It was horrible. We had seven people. I don't think the Holy Ghost was within 20 miles of that church. I'm just broken, completely broken. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I need a word from my pastor right now. I need an encouraging word from my spiritual authority. And I'm just sitting there with my head down, and I'm just heaving and sobbing, and I'm thinking, God, speak to my pastor right now. Give him a word for me right now. Let him have a prophetic word from heaven for me right now. And it seemed like an eternity. And he was doing nothing. Just letting me cry. I kept my head down. Finally, I heard him get up from his chair. I didn't lift my head, but I heard him get up. And he came around the corner, and I felt his presence near me. And inside, I started thinking... Here it comes. I'm going to get a word from God right now. I'm going to get a word that's going to keep me going right now. And I felt my pastor's hand on my shoulder. He put his hand on my shoulder. And I was primed for a prophetic word. When he leaned down into my ear and just simply said, Stay at it. I'm broken. And inside, I didn't say it to him, but inside I was thinking, is that it? Give me some more. And with that one simple phrase, he walked around and sat down in his chair and just looked at me. Just stay at it. Get back up in that pulpit. Next Sunday morning when Pentecost Sunday is over and it's just the 12 again, get up in that pulpit and preach the Word of God. When you feel the rush of the Spirit, stay at it. When you don't feel the Holy Ghost a million miles from there, stay at it. Oh, I got a word for a preacher right now. Stay at it. Stay at it. Stay at it. There is a day coming when heaven's going to open up. The glory of God is going to be seen. We must be faithful. Come on, somebody. Help me celebrate faithfulness tonight. Brother Huntley, I can take you to the Pentecost Sundays when we had 20 filled with the Holy Ghost, 25 filled with the Holy Ghost, 18 baptized in the name of Jesus. You say, how does that happen, Brother Gaddy? That's just Kevin. Oh, no, honey. That is a pastor and a church just staying at it day after day, week after week, year after year. If we will be faithful, God will show up. A 
Oh, I feel it. There's coming a day, Pastor, when you're going to preach and you're not going to be expecting it, but that back door is going to open up and prodigal children are going to walk down that aisle and be filled with the Holy Ghost. There's going to come a Sunday when healings are going to break loose. The power of the Holy Ghost is going to come in that house. Come on, I'd hate to give up one Sunday too soon. I'd hate to keep believing one weekend too soon. There is an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Stay at it. Stay at it. Stay at it. Be seated just for a moment. I have always, always, always been amazed by this guy in Acts chapter 1 named Matthias. Number one, I like his name. I like the way it rolls off the tongue. Matthias. He was the man who took Judas's place. And the Bible says that they proposed two. And then they cast lots. Now, I won't go into a long Standing of what that was like, but basically they just voted. They kind of put it out there and let the Lord, in fact they said, Lord show us which of these two will be numbered with the eleven. And the lot fell upon Matthias. Now, I need the help of these guys, this back row guys, can you come and help me real quick? Come on. Come and stand right here if you would. Just right here. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the great disciples right here of Jesus Christ. Right there, yeah. Aren't they good looking? Strapping, handsome, bulging with muscles. They just felt the anointing sweep in here. But if Jesus, well, he walked along the shores and healed bodies and opened up deaf ears, if he had taken a selfie, these are the guys that would be in the front row. I'm going to stop here and say this. As short as I am, I have never been on the back row of any picture. You know how much I long to be on the back row of a picture? But if Jesus had a picture with his disciples, here's the marquee names. But when it came time to replace Judas, another one of the front line picture guys, Here was the prerequisite. We must choose a man, Acts chapter 1, who has companied with us all the time. From John's baptism until right now. We don't need somebody that showed up yesterday saying this Jesus thing is pretty cool. We don't need somebody that meandered in last week and said, I heard Jesus is in town. But in the good times and the bad times, in the breaking of the bread and the fish and those that turned and walked away, we've got to choose somebody that has been there the whole time. So if you will look hard enough in the back of that picture, there's Matthias. We usually have to look on the second or the third row, but there he is. There he is at the raising of Jairus' daughter. There he is at the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. 
There he is when we came down off the Mount of Transfiguration. You don't see him up front, but he's in that second or third row. You'll notice that Matthias is there all the time. And his decision to show up every single time positioned him for an opportunity that he probably never thought he would ever get. I'm preaching to a pastor that's on the third row of the picture. And I'm saying to you, stay in the picture. Stay in the balance. Stay in the fight. Keep showing up. There is coming a day when God is going to break loose something that you get to be a part of that you didn't see coming. Oh, I feel faith rising up in this house. It might be this Sunday. It might be this month that God breaks something loose. You've been praying for it. You've been fasting for it. You've been asking for it. You've stayed faithful for it. There is coming a day. You may be seated. And the scripture simply says, and the lot fell upon Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, I want us to examine that word here for just a second. That wasn't some lottery ticket that happened at the day of Pentecost. But for three and a half years, Jesus had been walking and teaching and connecting and imparting. Jesus had showed up when people's kids were dead and when people needed bread to eat. For three and a half years, apostles walked with him on the mountaintop and by the lake. For three and a half years, they stayed faithful even in the midst of religious leaders putting them down and talking bad about them just stayed faithful. I'm going to be faithful in January. I'm going to be faithful in February. I'm going to be faithful in March and in April. I'm going to be faithful in May and I'm going to be faithful at Power Conference. I'm going to be faithful in the doldrums of the summer, July and August. In September, I'm going to stay faithful. October, I'm going to be faithful. November, I'm going to be faithful. December, I'm going to be faithful. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter who the governor is. It doesn't matter who goes where or who does what. I will stay faithful. Stand with me right now. I feel a prophetic spirit on me right now. Somebody is going to have a suddenly happen. Oh, Brother Huntley, I feel it. Somebody who's been on the third row of that picture for a long time. Jesus is going to say, it's your time. I've seen your faithfulness. I've seen your consecration. I'm going to open up something in your community you haven't ever seen before. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Suddenly it happened. I didn't see it coming, but suddenly it showed up. Brother, you can come to the keyboard. That'll help me to quit. Suddenly. I'm going to turn it back to you. We're going to pray in just a minute. I believe God's going to baptize this house with glory. Suddenly. How many of you will give God permission to surprise you? preaching on water baptism back in December of last year I didn't realize who all was there as a guest of our church big old tall lanky guy with his wife was sitting in the back 
I called everyone up front and I've had people turn to each other and say, have you been water baptized in the name of Jesus? Everybody did that. And I saw a lot of people doing this and a couple people doing that. I noticed a big, tall, lanky guy did that. He was standing right in front of the pulpit on the floor. I said, now if somebody said to you they have not been water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and they said no, if you ask them and they said no, I want to ask you a question, those of you that nodded no. How many of you would like to be water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins right now? And without hesitation, big old tall lanky guy, didn't just raise his hand, he came up on the platform right next to me. He's a big, tall drink of water. His hand is way up in the air. He's, I'm ready. I'm ready to be baptized right now. His wife, who was standing on the floor, she raised her hand. She said, I am too. So I grabbed one of our ministers who's over our baptistry ministry. I said, take him in the back and let's baptize him. They took him in the back. We water baptized Tommy and we water baptized his wife Karen she came up out of the water speaking with tongues it was a glorious service we baptized six people that morning I came out of the baptistry area and I had someone grab me and they said pastor do you know who that is big tall lanky guy I said no that's Tommy Smith I said that's good I like his name Tommy Smith Easy name to remember. They said, you don't know who Tommy Smith is? I said, no, I don't know who Tommy Smith is. They said, he's the number one talk show host on the number one talk show station in all of Arkansas. He has a show Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. And we just water baptized him in the name of Jesus Christ and his wife just got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> now I'm a child of the 80s and so my, my response was that's cool, that's cool now I want to say this everybody in the kingdom has equal value every single person has equal value but not everybody has the same influence so about 6.15 the next morning on Monday morning my phone starts blowing up Bishop my phone would not stop text messages just coming left and right and here's what they said, Pastor, Pastor, are you listening to the radio right now? I said, no, I'm sleeping. <laughs> they said, you got to turn on the radio. I turned on the radio, and they were talking about some sports thing, and I just turned it off. About an hour later, one of the men in our church sent me a transcript of what Tommy had said on the air that morning at 6.15. They have a segment of the show called, What'd You Do This Weekend? They went around the table talking about what they did. When it came to Tommy, Tommy said, y'all want to know what I did this weekend? They said, yeah, we want to know what you did. He said, I got water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. 100,000 watts strong, broadcasting it out all over the state of Arkansas. They said, you got water baptized. You mean just sprinkled? He said, no. They took me and put me under the water. My pastor preached that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You must be born of water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God. I didn't see that coming, Bishop. But I just made up in my mind, I'm going to keep on preaching it. I'm going to keep on speaking it and declaring it and saying, this is the way of the Lord. Walk in this way. Here's what I want us to do. I want you to reach over and find somebody. And I want you to speak faith over them right now. I want you to lift up your voice. I don't want you to mealy mouth a prayer, but I want you to say, Lord, I see it happening for them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, I see it happening for them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Come on, pastor. I see that day coming. I see that day coming. I see a visitation. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Come on, somebody is going to have a sudden move of God. Somebody is going to have a sudden visitation of the Holy Ghost. Come on, pastor, find another minister right now. Speak faith over them. Speak the word of God over them right now. There's coming a visitation. Oh, I feel it in the Holy Ghost. There is coming a visitation of the Spirit of Almighty God. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. Suddenly, there came a visitation from on high. Come on, somebody. I wish you would praise God like you would praise God when the miracle happens. I wish you would lift up your voice and glorify God like it's already taken place. It's already happening. God is at work. 